Okay, back again here. This would be the uh, third of the YouTube video files that uh, uh, we have recorded so far for the first class uh, down to the tab by uh, General Tools under the introduction. And let's click on down here. Oops. Oh, <laughs> technical difficulties. Uh oh. Uh, hold on a second here. I messed up. I hit the end key, which was not a good plan. To get some kind of a great idea how many slides we have to go through while I. All right, let's try this and then we'll try this. Okay, so that's where we were. Uh huh, okay. Uh, so these are just, uh, you know, some things that uh, we will refer to as we go through uh, this module. I mean, obviously we got thermodynamics, heat transfer and fluid flow in the background of all of this. There are very fundamental concepts. Uh, we will, and I have a copy uh, of some of these documents for you. I have a steam system survey guide, which I'll probably have you pick up in the, I'll probably just give it to you on Thursday because we won't, you won't need it uh, until even beyond that, um, steam system scoping tool, we've already uh, briefly introduced you to. Steam system modeler is some online steam sim, uh, system simulation uh, software that you can run uh, on the DOE website, and you'll have some homework on that. And then there's an insulation program, 3E Plus, that does insulation calculations for you. Uh, you will really, I think, enjoy both of those uh, software packages. They make life a lot easier. And then, of course, process me uh, measurements are also always tools that we use. Okay, so let's uh, uh, start digging a little bit deeper here. Boiler types and fuels. So, uh, I think it's sensitive today. I'm going to try to position this. Uh, so it's not in the way so much. This is a, uh, uh, we're gonna compare and contrast fire tube and water tube boilers here. So this is kind of a little bit of a cartoon, but it's a cross section of what we would call a fire tube boiler. And this is really a cylindrical shell and you're looking at the side of it. So if you looked at the ends, this is looking at uh, like a cross section. And so you can see it's circular. The shell is flooded with water. Uh, this tube is where the uh, combustion takes place and the burner uh, and oxygen are introduced and it fires a flame down half to two thirds the length of the boiler through this tube. And then the hot gas is turned and passed back and forth through these small uh, boiler tubes that are surrounded by the saturated liquid water which eventually boils off, accumulates at the top. So this red section here would be saturated steam. And then there's a pipe in the center that lets this stuff exit. So we got a burner firing down here. This, this is basically the burner. Hot gases go down. And so that's one pass. And then in this particular boiler, say we, then the gases have to turn at the end and come back. That's a second pass, they come back there and there, and then they turn again and go back for a third pass. So this would be a three pass fire tube boiler, would be the terminology. They make them one, two, three, four passes, and then the steam uh, accumulates up here at the top and then exits through this top pipe connection, and the flue gases go out this end. So that's what the fire tube is all about. The water tube boiler uh, is different, uh, and before I go on to the water tube, uh, this, uh, the fire tube boiler is limited to about 300 PSI, uh, PSIG in terms of the maximum pressure that it can operate at. This, there's just so much uh, surface area out here that sees the high pressure that the wall thickness just becomes too great and they're not economical to make. Uh, at pressures above 300. You don't really see that many at 300 even. Uh, it's certainly more typical uh, to have them operate between 100 and probably uh, 200, maybe 250 
there are some 300 psi uh, fire tube boilers out there. Uh, and then onto the water tube boiler. Um, what happens here is the feed water comes in this uh, disc, which is a long cylinder at the top. It's called a drum. And these are drum boilers. There's an upper drum and typically a lower drum. Uh, this is called the main drum or the steam drum. This is called the mud drum for obvious reasons. Any sediment or any crud in the system that is heavy tends to fall down to the mud drum. And we remove that with what's called a blow down flow that we'll talk about later. Um, so this drum uh, is probably two thirds or so full of water and it feeds these boiler tubes. So the water circulates from the top drum to the bottom drum and back up. Uh, the hot combustion gases are generated over here. In the combustion zone, this would indicate a burner. This type of boiler might have six, eight, 10, 12 burners on a large one. Small one might have, you know, two, three, four, something like that. But they, uh, they're burning here, firing out into this zone. There would be kind of a fireball out here. These hot gases would flow across the boiler tubes and then on up the flue, uh, steam generated in the tubes, uh, enters the steam drum where it's separated. And then this little pipe would indicate a superheater. Sometimes these boilers, in fact, fairly often, the water tube boiler will produce uh, superheated steam. So these uh, tubes connecting the drums are the steam generation tubes, sometimes called water wall tubes on big utility boilers where steam is generated and then the steam is separated. It comes down through these tubes where it is superheated and then it goes on out to the process use. Uh, these water tube boilers can generate very high pressures. Uh, in the utility industry, we see supercritical boilers uh, that are operate as high as 4,500 uh, pounds per square inch, uh, PSIG, um, and, and, and they uh, are, are very good at superheating. The fire tube boilers, like we said, are limited to about 300 PSIG, and they don't produce uh, superheated steam. It's all saturated from this type. Okay, so I've already spilled the beans on some of this, so this is just adding some of the notes. We can look over and see if there's anything here I missed. Uh, 300 PSIG maximum. Uh, boiler horsepower, and we'll talk about this in class. Uh, BHP, or boiler horsepower, uh, is not an electrical horsepower. Uh, it's a different unit. Um, it's typically about 30, there's 30 or 34.5 pounds mass per hour of steam generated per boiler horsepower. So if you had a 100 uh, horsepower boiler, that would be what, uh, 3,450 pounds per hour of steam generation would be its maximum nominal capacity. And we can, uh, we'll talk more about that in class. Again, saturated steam output. Uh, there is an inherent efficiency uh, advantage of uh, fire tube boilers over uh, water tube boilers, and that's that the temperature of the fluid around the shell is limited to the saturation temperature of the water, which is relatively low. So in this case, uh, if this is 100 PSIG, uh, steam, that's someplace around uh, 330, 340 Fahrenheit uh, will be the temperature on the inside of this shell that then is losing heat to the environment. That's a fairly low temperature for a boiler. A water tube boiler would have the combustion gases uh, on the outside of the shell and those could easily be 1800 to 2000 to 2200 degrees Fahrenheit, depending on where you are in the boiler. And so the temperature difference or the driving potential for shell loss is much greater on a fire tube than a water tube. So that is, uh, that's an important note to be aware of. Um, these are generally manufactured at a plant set on the back of a trailer and trucked in. Uh, Tennessee Tech bought a new uh, fire tube boiler, a 2,000 horsepower 
unit, which is on the upper side. I think they make a 2,500. That's the largest one I know of. Uh, and that 2,000, that's about 68,000 pounds of steam an hour potential. And that is our best boiler and our uh, in the winter time, that is our standard boiler to operate on the tech campus. And there are different styles of these things that we can go online and look at that. But they generally look like this. And I think I have a picture here in a minute of uh, or some other images for you. In fact, there it is. That's a Scotch Marine. And this is uh, a little closer to what they really look like on the front end. This would be the combustion air fan. This would be the uh, controls. On the boiler, this is the burner. Uh, this fan is probably pulling air up from the bottom the way this is set up. Sometimes they pull across the top of the boiler. Hot air in, uh, mixes with natural gas typically. Uh, so this is the burner assembly. This is the, uh, uh, the flame, the combustion fires down this large tube and then the gas is turned and come back and forth. So this shows the, uh, uh, the, the stack on this end, so on the front, so this is maybe down and back. Uh, this could be a two pass, or it's gonna be a two pass or a four pass, because it's down, back, back, and back to get to this end of the boiler. Um, the ends open for cleaning, rotting out tubes and stuff like that. Uh, we've got pressure gauges and controls up here on top, a safety valve. Uh, this is the gas train coming in uh, to uh, get the natural gas into the burner. Mm. Uh, there's usually, there's a port on the end where you can look down into the combustion zone. You can see the flame, what it looks like. So uh, I'd say that's about it. Okay. Now the water tube. Uh, Again, this is the same uh, picture we had before. Operating pressures in excess of 4,000 up to, I know they go to 4,500, they may even go higher than that, I don't know. Uh, our great big boilers are typically fire tube. You know, the utilities can get up to 10 million pounds an hour. Small ones could be as small as 5,000 pounds an hour. Uh, can, could be saturated, typically superheated output. Uh, the bigger ones are constructed on site, you know, modules brought in and uh, uh, put together. And there again, there's di many different styles of these as well. Uh, that shows uh, kind of some three-dimensional images of some water tube boilers. You can see over here, we show six burners. This would be the furnace area where the, the fireball is. Here's my upper drum, my lower drum, all of my tubing and then the gas is generated here. We go across all of these tubes and then out and up a stack. Uh, similar situation, wind box is supplying air into the burners. You got a man there just for physical perspective. Uh, steam drum on top, half to two thirds full of water. Boiler bank or water wall tubes, uh, superheater tubes, uh, screens. You, there are baffles in here to make sure that the flue gases uh, flow in the correct uh, sequence through the boiler. Uh, mud drum on the on the bottom, that sort of thing, and then steam comes out of uh, the drum, superheater, and air exits on this side. So that's roughly what's going on. Okay, some common fuels that uh, we can look at. Uh, natural gas is uh, probably the fuel of choice these days, and these uh, need to change these sale prices. Well, I mean, that's possible. Uh, today, we're seeing uh, uh, unit cost uh, any place from uh, about $3 up to maybe $8 or $9. And the sales unit here uh, is 1,000 standard cubic feet, which is nominally a million BTUs. So you can see that uh, the price per million BTUs is seven and the nominal price over here. Uh, sometimes these are not quite the same because all gas is not the same. So a standard cubic foot of gas, the nominal value is a thousand BTUs. Sometimes it's a little higher, sometimes it's a little lower. Uh, then on to number two, this is diesel fuel without the 
the automotive type or truck type additives. Uh, we've got a number six, which is a very thick fuel, has to be heated. LS would be low sulfur. HS would be high sulfur. We've got a couple of different kind of coals, Western, which is a, usually a bituminous, sub-bituminous, or Eastern rather, and Western is more of an anthracite. Uh, but there, I mean, there's all kinds of varieties in that. And, and green wood is roughly 40 to 50% moisture. It's not been dried. And you can see uh, relative prices. Again, I don't know how current these are. I mean, it's, they're, they're, they're ballpark. But so we typically see a coal has come up some uh, and natural gas has gone down to the point that natural gas and coal, at least for the big users, are pretty, are close to the same cost and natural gas is a whole lot more attractive fuel to burn than coal. But anyway, we'll, we'll work with numbers like this and um, compare energy cost. And to do that, and even electricity, we can compare on a cost per million BTUs. That's a common unit in the States. Okay, so let's move on further into uh, efficiency. Um, uh, so we'll go into a definition of efficiency here. That's how this, if you look in your thermal book, you'll probably see something like this. So, you know, generally speaking, an efficiency is a desired, uh, output divided by the costly input. So, you know, we go down to the lower equation here, and uh, so the desired energy output is the mass flow rate of steam times the enthalpy of the steam leaving the boiler minus the enthalpy of the feed water. That's pretty simple, m dot Cp delta T or m dot delta H. And then, of course, the, uh, the what you have to pay for is the fuel, and so that's the mass flow rate of fuel times the HHV. And HHV is higher heating value of the fuel. And roughly speaking, there is there is a lower heating value for fuel, for some fuels, and there's a higher heating value. And the difference between the two is the following. If the fuel contains hydrogen, the hydrogen will burn to water vapor. And at the end of the test, and there's, these heating values are determined typically in a bomb calorimeter, which is a, 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 a vessel where we put a, a very well-known amount of fuel. We combust it rapidly, i.e. the word bomb, which I guess a rapid combustion is known as an explosion in some circles. But anyway, we burn it, and then we measure all of the heat that comes out of it. And the question is, at the end of the test, what is the state of the water vapor? If they are the water that is generated from the hydrogen combustion. So again, hydrogen combust H2O. And at the end of the test, if that H2O is liquid, we get the higher heating value for the fuel because the water condensed gave up that latent heat and that got attributed to the energy release of the fuel. If on the other hand, the water created by the combustion is still in the vapor state, then it retains its latent heat. And so that latent heat does not get attributed to the combustion of the fuel. So uh, that's a fairly important distinction and that will come up on a quiz at some point, I promise. Okay. Uh, looking at, we'll have an example boiler in these slides that we will uh, follow along with. Um, so let's see, it's a boiler that's fired with natural gas, a higher heating value of uh, 23,311 BTUs per pound, uh, which is 1,000 BTUs per standard cubic feet. Uh, gaseous fuels are usually talked about in terms of the, the standard cubic foot of gas combustion. Uh, steam conditions on a boiler 400 PSIG, that's gauge. Again, uh, we need to be cognizant of the difference between PSIA, which is absolute pressure measured relative to absolute vacuum, and PSIG, which is measured relative to atmospheric pressure, which is nominally 14.7. 
So if you have PSIG and want PSIA, you got to add 14.7 or barometric pressure to it. Uh, if you have PSIA and want PSIG, you got to uh, subtract atmospheric pressure from it. And remember, if you go to the steam tables, that you have to use uh, PSIA to look up steam properties. So you have to add on the uh, uh, 14 and a half or, or 14.7 or 15, whatever, depending on the amount of accuracy that you want. Okay, so our uh, example boiler is producing 100,000 pounds of steam per hour on a steady basis. Uh, the boiler rating is 120,000, so that's the maximum that it can produce. Uh, our feed water is supplied at 600 PSIG and 242 Fahrenheit. The fuel supply is 149,000 standard cubic feet per hour or 2480 standard cubic feet per minute. And the fuel cost is $10 a million or $10 per thousand standard cubic feet. Uh, we use 10 in this. It's probably high by today's standards, but you know, if you, it, it's a nice round number. And so if the fuel cost was to be five, you could just divide by two and you basically adjusted for a $5 a million fuel charge. So 10's a, a handy number to work with. Okay, so uh, just a simple equation for calculating uh, the cost, capital K dot is the operating cost of the boiler. Uh, for some period, in this case, it's on this slide, it's going to be per year. So V dot is the fuel flow rate, which is 149,000 standard cubic feet per hour. Uh, the kappa, lowercase kappa fuel, is the cost, $10 per uh, thousand standard cubic feet, and hours is, would be the hours of operation that we want. The operating cost for, in this case, it's a year. That's our standard number of hours per year. 8,760 hours per year. So that would say that this boiler is going to cost $13 million per year to operate. Okay, and then we can calculate a cost of steam. And so if we take that 13 million and uh, we're going to, we're making 100,000 pounds an hour and we're going to do that for every year, uh, hour of the year. And there's another thousand that's not listed here because you'll notice the unit over here is $14.90 per thousand pound mass. So if you want to make the, if you want to get $14.90, if you take uh, 13 million divided by 100,000 divided by 8760, you got to divide it by another thousand to get it in units of thousand pound mass. And that's the way steam costs are typically given cost per thousand pounds of steam. And that's because if you do cost per one pound of steam, it's just a little bitty obnoxious number. You know, if that was per pound, it would be what? 0 0.0149. And it's just obnoxious. So we multiply it by a thousand and make it 14.9. <coughs> and it's not quite so obnoxious. Okay. Okay. Well, a typical boiler will have an efficiency of what do you think? You know, usually if we're doing this in class, we'll let people raise hands and guess, but I guess on a YouTube video that doesn't work very well, so we'll just move on. Um, it depends on the fuel a lot. I mean, it depends on the boiler too, but it also depends on the fuel. So typical boiler efficiencies for wood, and so that could be, and for green wood, it might even be worse. Uh, for dried wood, it might be a little bit better because green wood is nominally 50% moisture, 40 to 50%. And that's a lot of water to put in, you know, is mixed in with your fuel to go into the boiler. So, and that affects the efficiency significantly. A natural gas boiler, uh, typical efficiency is 82. You can see them higher, 82, 83, 84. Uh, sometimes a little bit higher than that. <clears throat> and uh, oil and coal can be as high as 90%. So, you know, a question is, why would the oil and coal boilers be inherently a little more efficient than a natural gas boiler? And the answer is the amount of hydrogen between those two fuels. 
because that hydrogen burns to water vapor and typically leaves in the vapor state and water vapor carries a lot of energy with it. <clears throat> and so the natural gas, while it's a great fuel, uh, you know, is basically methane, most of it, <coughs> and that's CH4. And so for one carbon, you get four hydrogens. So for one carbon, you get two H2O molecules that leave uh, and carry a bunch of energy with it. The uh, Coal and oil will have a much higher concentration of carbon, a lower concentration of hydrogen, and so they don't carry away as much energy uh, in water vapor in the stat gas. So that's uh, what's going on there in general. <laughs> of course, boilers have different uh, uh, amounts of efficiency enhancing uh, options, and so you know, there's a variety based on you know, what, what boiler did you buy. Okay, so for the example boiler, we want to determine uh, the steam generation efficiency. And this can also be called the boiler efficiency, the first law efficiency, the fuel to steam energy conversion efficiency. And I'm sure there's a bunch more out there that we could uh, talk about or that we could mention. Okay, some uh, thermodynamic properties of the various uh, states around the boiler. So we're saying that you know we've got superheated steam at 700 uh, degrees Fahrenheit at 400 psig, which is 414.7 psia, and these are just out of the steam tables, <laughs> specific volume, enthalpy, entropy, and we're just listing psig over here to compare to psia here, and so for uh, saturated vapor at 400, these are the properties. We said quality would be 100%. Quality is not defined in the superheat region. And uh, saturated liquid, deaerator storage, um, feed pump exit, we're at the high pressure, we're at 600 and 242. So that's a compressed liquid or subcooled liquid, uh, etc. Okay, so we'll be using some of those numbers here in just a second. Okay, so plugging in for our example boiler for the uh, classic efficiency calculation, we'll see that we have the, you know, while we saw the equation, we described it before. So I think this is just plugging the numbers, mass flow rate of steam, enthalpy of steam, enthalpy of feed water, uh, fuel flow rate, and the uh, uh, higher heating value of the fuel, okay? And just, or if you want to do the fuel on a mass flow basis, the standard density natural gas is 0.043. And so then you can multiply this by this and get this. And then you can use the uh, heat, higher heating value on a mass basis. So whichever, you get the same answer. So this boiler we're saying is 77.1%. And this is known as a direct efficiency evaluation. <coughs> 